Well, it's obvious you're well educated. You saw the need to uh, obtain more knowledge and to get better in certain areas. So what would you say was the secret to your career success? Well, I, I arrived at really an, uh, a real line in the sand moment for McKinsey and I think management consulting period. So if you remember, I would 2000, I would have joined in August of 2000 in London. We had maybe four months left of the dot-com you know, sort of bubble part and then it all fell apart in early 2001. And we were forced to look around we McKinsey, and particularly those of us in the organization practice, say, boy, there were a lot of companies that we were calling excellent, and they're just not around anymore. I mean, where I'm from, in the Lehigh Valley, we had Lucent. And you know, I had friends, friends and as parents worked at Lucent, and at one point were paper millionaires. But what did you do, or what have you been doing, or well, you know, past, present, future Well, that tense? was the impetus, right. Okay. It was the, I'll tell you, the, 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 the reason for the, the, the way I think those companies matter, because they were iconic companies that went away in London, a company that was called GEC that then became Marconi, like their GE, lost 98% of its value in like six weeks. Right? Really, you know, the Enron uh, example had happened. And so as a person who supposedly was a, a student and a deep thinker about why organizations behave the way they do, McKinsey had collected a couple of us together and said, listen, we want to get, we want to get really deep in understanding what went wrong. And so our first push in terms of the background of this material, saying, could we go and look at companies that were previously called excellent and find out why some of them have remained excellent and why some just went away? And so we had gone all the way back to the early 80s and found our colleague's book, In Search of Excellence, written by Peters and Waterman. We took their list of companies, and then we went to the original Jim Collins book when he was still writing with Jerry Porras and took their list of companies. We put them all together and said, okay, by 2001, what happened to those companies? And rough numbers. A third of them didn't exist, a third were struggling, a third were doing great. And when we looked at the ones that were doing great versus the others, there was one really simple truth. They paid attention to making money, but they really paid attention to how they made the money. We're in plain language now, how, we no, how we're gonna make money and how we're gonna run the place. And the people that didn't exist anymore got myopically focused on just how they made money and almost always the quarterly cycle. And they made really poor choices, almost always short-sighted choices. So but what did Bill do, what did you do, or what have you done to either help these companies and to thrive in your current role, to ascend to the level at which you are today? Well, um, I'm probably more predisposed to say we, but there were a couple of pretty important moments. A colleague and I had both just finished our PhDs, his and IO, mine in management, and we were given an, uh, an opportunity by McKinsey to say, we want to start measuring this idea of how you run the place, what we called organizational health. And so we wrote the instrument that is now still used to this day called the Organizational Health Index. And that allowed us to bring real rigor, not hand waving, not conversation, absolute uh, psychometrically like sound empirical data. rigor. Mm -hmm. When we wrote it, we wrote it with the assumption that we were going to write an article either for uh, you know, the Academy of Management Journal or Journal of Applied Psychology, the most st stringent test, and it was written with that rigor in mind and tested against that. And we still use it to this day, right? So if you were to point to one initial moment, it was I was able to convince my colleagues that rigor mattered. And if you could measure it, then we could get really narrow about understanding what was going on, not just, oh, people aren't engaged. Just, no, 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 what exactly is going on? And once you could do that, then you could do something about it. And then from that moment, we really started focusing on the implementation part. Mm -hmm. If you know something is broken in the way the message goes from the CEO to their, you know, to their front line, what can we do about it? Okay. And so that was the starting point. And that's what makes Bill this powerhouse in organizational health, management, management consulting. I'm just, I'm yeah. just trying to get down to it's, it's worked what, out. Makes, what makes Bill so dynamic? What makes you, what, for those who are watching, yeah. what's that secret sauce? <laughs> well, I, look, I'll tell you, I think it's three things. I mean, one, the background and the theoretical rigor matters because it helps how you view the world, right? I mean, there's 70 years of really good German psychologists who've told us a lot about why people behave the way they do. We don't need to make it up. That's one, right? Two, I think I do a pretty good job of taking what can be really complicated ideas and using plain language. So I could keep saying organizational health, but in plain language, it's how you run the place. Mm. Okay. Right, and then three, make it pointed enough that the most ardent, finance-oriented, numbers-driven person will pay attention to it. 
like a simple fact that's called run it better and you make more money. And it's like three times more money. Well, people right. want to hear you talk about that, I'm sure. Right. Well, that works. <laughs> right? right? Because when they pay attention to that, then they'll say, okay, so what do we do about it? I go, right. So that's the hard part. So let's get into how do you actually change, change the place. And I've been given the luxury of working my way around the different aspects of that. I, I ran our global talent practice for a while, ran our large-scale change practice in North America with my co-author, actually, Scott Keller and I. Um, and have been able to come up with some really cool tools on things like each of us has a personal network. There's people that we think that are more influential than others because we believe them. That happens at work. Came up with a really cool way to map that. Right? So rather than just trusting what the boss says, because most people don't, figure out who someone's influencer network is and use them. Right? And that makes it far more likely the person's going to buy the message. Mm -hmm. So those things, right? It's been a great way of bringing money and psychology, bringing it together and using incredibly plain language.